Preston and Sterling Morton, Distinguished Service Professor of History at the University of Chicago, where he has been since 2008. Seven. Uh, or seven. Uh, <laughs> and during that time, he's also been the director for the Center for the Study of Race. Is that still the case? No longer. No longer. Um, race, politics, and culture. And of course, as you know, Ramon previously taught at the University of California, San Diego, where he founded the Ethnic Studies uh, Department and the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, and where he was also a vice chancellor. And as I fondly remember, uh, he fought the good fight on behalf of Latino research in the uh, UCOP, for those of you that don't know, the Uni University of California Office of the President. Um, remember some meetings where we came away with hoarse voices and, <laughs> and, and whatnot. Uh, Ramon is the editor, uh, co-editor, co-author of 10 volumes, and the author of dozens of uh, essays, including for our own Aslan, a journal of Chicano studies. His prolegomenon in American Quarterly in 1993 called Community, Patriarchy, and Individualism, the Politics of Chicano History, represented one of the most stimulating and insightful provocations in the field of Chicano historiography. We're hoping for more of the same uh, today. today. And it also introduced me to the word prolegomenon. <laughs> uh, remember the first time I used it, I followed it. I, had to I see. Practice <laughs> pronouncing it. So maybe I've I, I got to use more big words. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And of course, we all know Ramon is the author of When Jesus Came, the Corn Mothers Went Away, published by Stanford University Press in 1991. What the book did for the study of the Spanish borderlands, the history of sexuality, Chicano studies, uh, not to mention archival-based research into the interconnection of uh, cultural conflict, religion, uh, generational <coughs> difference, racial identity, and power, cannot be overstated. Suffice it to say that the book won just about every award in the many fields it impacted. We are delighted to have Ramon here in LA this year, where he is a, a research fellow at the Huntington. We're also fortunate to be joined by Laura Gomez, who will be a discussant following the talk. Laura has returned to UCLA after a five-year sojourn at the University of New Mexico. Eight. Or, or seven, nine, ten. <laughs> you people have to check what's available for you in your departments online. Uh, where she published her second, third, or fourth book, Manifest Destinies, The Making of the Mexican-American Race, which in many ways, or perhaps not, offers a sequel uh, to <laughs> When Jesus Came. Uh, that sounds a little weird without it's saying uh, <laughs> the rest of the title, The Corn uh, Mothers Went Away. Uh, <laughs> examining how law and racial ideology intersected to create new racial groups and to restructure the turn of the century racial, uh, racial order in the United States. Uh, Ramon, it's, uh, it's, it's really great to have you visiting here from the other UC, the University of Chicago. <laughs> and I have to say that uh, your, your presence has been uh, sorely noted. Uh, so, by way of introduction, let me say a little bit about the Ramon that I know. Oh, dear. As a historian, <laughs> Ramon looks to the past. And as a Chicano, he engages the present moment with what Ruben Salazar called a non-Anglo image of himself. And as an educator, he looks to the future. The title of his talk today gestures towards all three temporalities, utopian and dystopian narratives of the Chicanao past, present, and future. <laughs> But it is Ramon's belief in the future, its hope, its contingency, its not hearedness, that is signaled most profoundly on his webpage at the University of Chicago. There, in the section labeled Biography, it states simply and emphatically, coming soon. <laughs> While people, he is here now. Please join me in welcoming the Ramon. <laughs> Jeez. I better. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Like Laura, I better read what's on that web page. I have no idea. I have no idea what's actually there. Uh, thank you, Joan, for that wonderful introduction, uh, and thank you. Uh, I should thank uh, Laura because she uh, volunteered to comment on the or be a discussant on this paper, and it was only yesterday that she got it because I only last night finished it. But anyway, uh, most uh, social scientists always use PowerPoint, and uh, historians have a convention of always reading their papers and using uh, <laughs> text, so I hope you'll bear with me. Not long ago, I arrived in San Francisco to speak to a group of university presidents. Emerging from the underground Muni station at the corner of Market and Van Ness, I found myself amid a boisterous demonstration in front of the Bank of America.
There were angry, placard-carrying protesters, cops, and commotion galore. The din of the bullhorns was echoing so loudly that I couldn't entirely make out a word. I turned to an African-American man who was standing nearby with a group of men that appeared to be homeless. Do you know what they're protesting all about, I asked. The answer I got was a string of profanities about the stupid Mexicans who were invading San Francisco and who couldn't speak English. Indeed, the protesters were shouting in Spanish about the corrupt home foreclosure policies of the Bank of America, something the homeless man would probably have endorsed, but apparently had no tolerance for because, no tolerance for because it was in a language he didn't understand. Shocked by what the man said, I quickly realized I was back in uncivil California, where over the last 20 years, electoral politics have been virulently racist, ugly in their nativist tones, and unfairly punitive to the Mexican immigrants who construct buildings, cook meals, clean homes, and care for the infants and the elderly. As you all well know, between 1994 and 1997, Propositions 187, 209, and 227 were passed by the citizens of this state, I should say by the electorate of this state, outlawing the delivery of public services to immigrants, uh, um, prohibiting set-asides based on race and gender and veteran status, and abolishing bilingual education. This anti-immigrant pathology has spread rapidly to other states, infecting and fracturing the body politic, the very social contract that keeps society intact. Ward Connerly, John Tanton, Tom Tancredo, Lou Dobbs, Patrick Buchanan are but just a few of those who have successfully spread this toxic xenophobic gospel, which most recently and most notoriously has blossomed in the parched deserts of Arizona, where many unauthorized Mexican immigrants have died slow deaths of desiccation. Those who have survived in the shadows of existence now confront a policy that enacted uh, that the state of Arizona enacted in Senate Bill 1070, legislation that abrogates federal authority over immigration, allowing local authorities to demand identification from anyone to establish their immigrant status. Arizona recently mandated English-only public instruction and outlawed any educational program or class quote, that promotes resentment towards a race or class of people or advocates ethnic solidarity instead of treatment of pupils as individuals, end quote. This has gone into effect, and indeed there has been an attempt to uh, dismantle the Mexican-American Studies program in the Tucson Unified School District uh, because of its ethnic uh, chauvinism. And the last wonderful and brilliant thing that Arizona has done is that in February 22nd of last year, they also approved a bill denying birthright citizenship to any child born to unauthorized immigrants in the United States, clearly intending to challenge the constitutionality of the 14th Amendment all the way to the Supreme Court. When one looks historically for the causes of such nativism, the most commonly invoked explanations point to downturns in economic cycles, ancient religious and racial hatreds, and intense competition between citizens and denizens for scarce work. There is no doubt that the current economic recession and the Latinization of the Republic have exacerbated nativism and white fears. What appears unique now is its anti-state dimensions. Arizona and other states want to abrogate the federal government's control over immigration and our historical understanding of birthright citizenship. Many societies over the course of human history have sometimes aspired to possess or create homogeneous populations. Japan has been the country, the only country that even remotely has approached the ideal, although Germany's Adolf Hitler certainly tried through his genocidal campaign in the name of racial purity. Every other society, be they in ancient, medieval, or modern times, has failed in achieving such unity for a host of reasons. They have failed because the dynamic urban centers from which civilizations arose were constantly plagued by disease and by low levels of reproduction, and thus always had to import labor, either from the countryside or by conquering and subjugating populations nearby, by purchasing slave labor, or by relying on temporary sojourners tempting local tastes with unique and exotic trade goods. Trade has always promoted ethnic mixing, and trade has been global since at least 1492. 
Since its origins in 13 colonies, the United States has long thought of itself as a white republic and has periodically tinkered with its immigration laws to further that goal. Forging a racially unitary nation has failed in every era because the United States never had a dense native population able to provide the labor necessary for building the nation's industries and infrastructure. The original 13 colonies continually, uh, continuously imported labor and did so first by relying mainly on debt, English debt peons. By 1680, most of these laborers had fulfilled their terms of contract and had been set free and it was then that the importation of African slaves began in mass. By the early 19th century, mounting European condemnation of the slave trade gradually led to the abolishment of slavery in the Americas, which was finally ended in the United States uh, on January 1st, 1863, in the midst of the Civil War, with President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation liberating some four, four million African Americans, mostly residing in the South. Almost simultaneously, the burgeoning republic turned to new immigrants to provide the basis for capital accumulation and economic growth, welcoming first Irish immigrants escaping the great hunger caused by the potato famine between 1845 and 1852, then taking German refugees of the 1848 revolutions that soon followed. In the subsequent decades, workers from Asia, Latin America, from Eastern and Southern U Europe reached America's shores to fuel this country's industrial developments, its national transportation network, its mineral extraction, and agriculture in the West. Between 1848 and 1898, the U.S. also incorporated millions of foreigners by conquest, Mexicans in the Southwest, Puerto Ricans in the Caribbean, and Filipinos in Asia. Rising fears about the effects of, that immigration and territorial annexation were having on the body politic, namely a mongrelization of the white race, led to the enactment of the Johnson-Reed Act in 1924, severely restricting the number of putatively racially inferior immigrants from Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Southern and Eastern Europe through nation-based quotas. The goal of these national quotas, which were in place until 1965, was an ambitious project of social engineering to construct a white dominant population by severely restricting immigration. It was America's version of Hitler's racial cleansing. The nation's mobilization for World War II helped accomplish this by restricting outsiders, transforming residents into citizens, and stigmatizing African Americans, Mexicans, and Asians through the imposition of a standard language, mandatory schooling, and compulsory military service, the United States created a white American identity that welded population, territory, language, and culture into a unitary sense of nation and shared destiny. The project rewarded GIs with special benefits, put millions of them to work through a massive expansion of the federal government's employment, held down inflation and guaranteed their investments, or the standard economic props that promote democratic rule over dictatorship. The 1924 Johnson-Reed Act criminalized Mexicans in the United States. They quickly became illegal aliens wetbacks and greasers, and were stigmatized as inordinately prolific, rapidly birthing inferior breeds, simultaneously capable of backbreaking work, yet lazy and profligate in their ways, easily controlled and deported, yet willingly accepting their super exploitation and torment without whimper or recourse. The United States already had a segregated African-American population born of slavery, suffering under the weight of discriminatory Jim Crow laws, performing poorly paid labor, and in many places competing with immigrants. The supply of Mexican unauthorized labor was augmented at the beginning of World War II by importing Mexican workers through the Bracero program, and from 1942 to 1965, some four and a half million Mexican workers entered the American Southwest through, legally through this program. If one includes those workers employed without visas, the numbers are perhaps as high as 10 million Mexicans having entered in those periods. Between 1955 and 1965 alone, approximately 350,000 braceros entered yearly, all of this was changed by the 1965 Immigration Act, which restricted 
and lowered the number of Mexican immigrants allowed to enter with authorization to only 30,000 a year. This is how roughly half a million Mexicans who were being employed yearly in the Southwest were made into illegal aliens by the state, racialized Ill illegal, primarily for the advantage of their employers. Quote, the American nation has always had a specific core, and that core has been white, wrote Peter Brimlow in his highly hailed book, Alien Nation. Americans, he continued, have a right to demand that their government stop shifting the nation's racial balance. Indeed, it seems to me that they have the right to insist that it be shifted back, end quote. Brimler's words, though particularly incendiary in their rhetoric, capture the tone and tenor of the anti-Mexican rants expressed by many others in Who Are We? The Challenges to American National Identity, written by Samuel P. Huntington in 2004, he warned that the cultural division between Hispanics and Anglos would soon replace the racial division between blacks and whites as the most potentially incendiary cleavage in American society. The vast majority of Hispanics are of Mexican descent. Most entered the country illegally, have reproduced much more rapidly than whites or blacks by a ratio of about five to one. They keep, they keep speaking Spanish at home and work, refused to learn English, were leading highly segregated lives among their own, and were largely confined to society's lowest economic rungs. These facts, Huntington warned in his last major publication before his death, portended anarchy, racial war, and a separatist national sentiment akin to that found in Quebec. Patrick Buchanan wrote The State of Emergency, The Third World Invasion and the Conquest of America in 206, shortly after the massive pro-immigrant protests against House Bill 4437. Quote, they are coming to conquer us, Buchanan warned, outlining what he called as the Atslan strategy. He dogged Antonio Villaraigosa and Cruz Bustamante as mechistas and argued that because of the quote, grudge against the gringo, end quote, the Mexican government, Mexican immigrants, and Chicano activists were determined to, quote, end the United States as a sovereign, self-sufficient, independent republic, the passing away of the American nation, end quote. At this moment of stunning revolts by hopeless youth against authoritarian regimes in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, with a host of other Middle Eastern dictatorships teetering, it is important to recall that these dystopic visions of America's future have come not only from the anti-immigrant right, but from the pro-immigrant left as well. In a now largely forgotten 1988 book by David Hayes, Batista, and Jorge Chapa entitled The Burden of Support, Young Latinos in an Aging Society, they predicted a particularly lethal revolt based on race, age, and class, where young, undereducated, and poorly paid Mexican Americans would lash out against an older, wealthier, and much better educated white population dependent on government services as they aged. To pay for these services, the government would have to heighten the taxation of emerging majority minorities, and that this would and this would promote animosities, rage, and maybe even war, given the long history of resentment and of reactive identities born of racism and discrimination. Batista and his co-authors showed the aging of the white Anglo population, which would rapidly accelerate in 2010, just a couple of years ago, when the baby boom generation would start to turn 65. The pool of Social Security recipients would more than double between 1990 and 2020, placing enormous burdens on the federal government, particularly through Medicare. Indeed, this scenario was sketched out correctly by Hayes Batista in the fact that we are now seeing the debates over how Medicare will be paid for uh, uh, currently in Washington, D.C. As early as 1995, the majority of children in California's public schools were Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans. The reproduction rate for Latinos is now 8.9 births for every death, while for Anglos the rate is 1 to 2. The median age for ethnic Mexicans in the United States is 26, while for non-Hispanic whites it is 44. 
The 2010 census count, count noted that 47% of the country's total population was composed of people of color under the age of 18. And indeed today, to this very day, 2012, young people of color under the age of 18 are now the majority in this country. The 2010 census statistics put the country's Latino population at 50.5 million, or 16% of the country's total. Mexican Americans, Chicanos, and Mexicanos account for 30.8 million, or 61% of this total. From 2000 to 2010, the ethnic Mexican population of the U.S. has grown by 54%. These numbers of demographic ascendancy are often parroted by political pundits and policy elites to portend a rosy future, a utopian future, in which we will ultimately count. Both Republicans and Democratic contenders for the presidency will have to count the Latino vote, Arizona Senator John McCain recently pronounced, but how one cajoles us by building border fences to electrocute us, as Herb Cain wanted to, by calling our bilingualism, quote, the language of, of living in the ghetto, end quote, which were Newt Gingrich's words, or by deporting us in record numbers for minor infractions at the level of 400,000 a year, as President Obama has done, bodes poorly for any Republican or Democratic strategy either party may concoct to win the White House and the Latino vote. Senator Marco Rubio's name is bantered about as the vice presidential nominee for the, uh, for the Republicans, hoping that he will be able to uh, lure in the Latino vote. The fact that, uh, that Marcos Rubio has a phony refugee story may play well uh, among South Florida's Cuban-American Republicans. Whether it will get Mexican-Americans in Los Angeles to vote Republican might be a much harder and a much bigger stretch. Whatever the rhetoric of the president about the importance of the Latino generally and ethnic Mexicans more specifically, the fact is that since Howard Jarvis began his taxpayer revolution in California in 1978 with the passage of Proposition 13, California's public schools have, have, been, have, been going, have, have, have gone from being among the best in the country to being among the worst. They are now ranked 48th in the country. Over the last decade, as minorities have come to dominate public school attendance, it has been all too easy to disinvest in our state's K-12 educational system and increasingly in its colleges and universities. In today's Los Angeles, for example, only 5% of all students in the Los Angeles Unified School District are Caucasian, while 37% of the city's population claim to be Caucasians. If one's children are enrolled in private schools or are homeschooled, it hardly matters if public schools close their libraries, cut their art, music, and physical education classes, and close down advanced placement courses. The end result, notes UCLA education professor Danny Solorzano, is that the schools are failing to educate Mexican Americans, or for that matter, African Americans, too. Of every hundred ethnic Mexicans, who currently enrolled in elementary school in California, 53 of them will drop out at some point in the K through 12 educational pipeline. Only 47 will graduate from high school, and out of these, only 26 will pursue some form of post-secondary education. Of these 26, only eight will graduate with a baccalaureate degree. Only three of these college graduates will enroll in advanced degree granting programs or professional schools. And finally, less than one is ever likely to receive a doctoral degree or a doctoral or professional degree. This is the young population that in less than 20 years will be called upon to support older whites through their payroll taxes. Will there be a gleeful coexistence, a holding of hands and singing kumbaya, or will there be a racial revolt, a resentment and hatred? Such dystopic scenarios need not dictate our future. Recall for a moment the Plan Espiritual de Atzlan, the 1969 document that birthed the Chicano and Chicana youth movements, spelling out how national unity and political empowerment could be achieved. It called for a coalition among the racially oppressed for community control of local institutions 
and communitarian management of its resources through responsible capitalism, for culturally relevant educational curricula with community control over the schools, for the development of institutions that protected civil and human rights and guaranteed fair wages, for community self-defense through humanitarianism, and for a contestational cultural politics, quote, to defeat the gringo dollar value system, end quote, and for a pluralist coalitional politics and rejection of the two-party system. In the 43 years since the plan was issued, many have repudiated its vulgar nationalism, its fracturing of the liberal civil rights coalition, the culture of violence and hypermasculinity it celebrated, and the homophobia and gender hierarchies that structured its bedrooms and its boardrooms. The plan nevertheless created an alternative vision of cultural incorporation and membership in a body politic, challenged unbridled capitalism, simultaneously linking local struggles for self-determination with global anti-imperialist ones, creating organizations for community policing such as the Brown Beret, food cooperatives, free breakfast programs, educational campaigns for safer food supply and healthier bodies. Chicano and Chicana nationalism in the late 1960s and early 70s was but a very short moment an instance in a much larger and longer history of protests and resistance against exploitation, racism, and segregation that easily can be chronicled from 1837 to the present and beyond. Juan Gomez Quinones documented the organizing of the anarchist brothers uh, Flores Magón and the Partido Liberal Mexicano in California and Texas. Jose Limon and Ben Johnson have described the 1915 Plan de San Diego, Texas to create an army to liberate the Mexican race from Anglo control and to erect an independent nation, a Texas restored. Vicky Ruiz, Magdalena Mora, Adelaide del Castillo, Olivia Urieta, Milo Alvarez, Ben Marcus, and Mario Garcia have recounted the long history of Mexican-American civil rights movements that had their origins in racially segregated Catholic confraternities from the 16th to the 19th centuries, in mutual aid societies in the 1920s, in labor unionism from the 1930s to the present, in the litigation undertaken by organizations like LULAC and the American GI Forum, and in the cultivated sense of membership, of citizenship, of national belonging and shared sacrifice that fighting in World War II, in the Korean War, and in Vietnam created among Hispanic veterans which became all the more a cause for mobilization when they realized that the fruits of American capitalism were not equally being shared at home. It was that civil engagement of veterans in the 1950s that led to the civil rights revolution in housing, education, and employment that followed in the 1960s. As the number of ethnic Mexicans has grown in the U.S., clearly class divides have emerged as well. The rich are still very, very few in number, not even 1%, not even 0.001% of the ethnic Mexican population of the United States. There are a handful of Horatio Alger stories of Mexicanos who arrived in the United States penniless and who rose to significant wealth through hard work. In 1995, when the magazine Hispanic Business studied the richest Hispanics known to have assets over $10 million, they found 75 individuals. 25 were of Mexican origin, the rest were mainly from Spain and Cuba. Most of them, by the way, were already wit rich when they had arrived in the United States. The exceptions were a handful of entertainers, athletes, and manufacturers of ethnic products. The, more, the most common success path from poverty into a professional class, and sometimes to wealth, has been through the military. Men and women who joined the military took advantage of the training it offered. The government guaranteed loans to enter college and from there went to law school and politics. This was the path that Bill Richardson took first as a U.S. congressman, eventually becoming U.S. ambassador to the U.N., secretary of energy, and finally go governor of New Mexico, and finally in 2008 pr candidate for the presidency of the United States. This too was the trajectory that Colin Powell took to his post as Secretary of State. In 1992, this country had a total of 17.2 million business firms. Those owned by Hispanics numbered 771,000, or 0.4 of all firms. In 
By 2007, the number of Hispanic-owned firms had risen to 2.2 million, or 8% of all these firms. The telling number is that the 8% of all Hispanic businesses represented only 1% of total receipts, meaning that these enterprises are usually local ma and pop stores, small food distribution companies, and franchises of very small size. Almost half of all Latinos owned firms, uh, all Latino owned firms, have receipts of less than $10,000. The average receipts for Latino businesses is, is $94,000 compared to $193,000 for all firms. Studying the relationship between the sectors in which ethnic Mexicans own businesses, are concentrated and the wage dynamism of these areas, economist Manuel Pastor found that while Anglos and Asians were concentrated in high-wage, fast-growth sectors, the majority of Mexicans were in low-wage, slow-growth sectors, portending dire consequences for the long-term economic future of Latinos. Equally troublesome is the fact that over the last decade, Mexicans have had the highest rate of labor force participation of any racial or ethnic group. 85% of those Mexicans who are age eligible to work, both males and females, found employment, while among, among whites, only 77% did. High poverty rates among ethnic Mexicans thus reflect not indigence, but the working poor, limited by low levels of educational achievement and restricted social networks that do not provide leverage for better jobs. Mexican Americans have a long history of poverty as a class, not because they do not wish to work, but because of government policies. Between 1850 and 1890, most of the original Mexican residents of the Southwest lost their lands because the government would not recognize their prior claims. By necessity, they became domestic workers and farm laborers who then were exempted in 1933 from the Social Security Act and from a number of other pieces of legislation that ultimately went on to protect workers' rights. The 10% of wages withheld from braceros by the American government as a guarantee that they would return to Mexico between 1942 and 1965 uh, were never recovered. The litigation go on, goes on. Mexican Americans were first kept from home ownership by the redlining of areas where minorities lived, and most recently they have been uh, imp impoverished by predatory lending. The Great Recession of 2008 intensified the skew of inequality in the U.S. Until 2007, home equity was the major financial asset Latino households held. Before the crash, the median household net worth of whites, including the value of their home, was $143,600. For African Americans, it was $9,300, and for Latinos, it was $9,100. These measures, by these measures, the average white household in the United States had 15 times more wealth than the average Latino or, Af or African American household. If one subtracts the potential wealth African Americans and Latinos had as a result of home ownership, the median household wealth of African Americans was reduced to a mere $500. For Latinos, it became $400, while for whites, it remained at $43,600. The Great Recession of 2008 saw the value of home equity evaporate for many. As Raul Hinojosa and Paula Cruz Takesh recently estimated, between 2007 and 2009, home foreclosure costs Latinos between $75 billion and $98 billion. This was due largely to the fact that Latinos were offered expensive subprime mortgage loans by lenders at rates three and four times higher than whites. With mortgages they could scarcely afford and higher rates of unemployment during the downturn, Latinos were, many Latinos were thus left homeless. At this moment in time, the steps towards wealth formation seem clear. Without legal status as an immigrant, one dares not accumulate wealth for fear of deportation or the seizure of one's assets. Without a high school, high school diploma, one cannot obtain access to an advanced educational or vocational degree, a good paying job, or health benefits. Without a good paying job, one cannot own a house or business. 
without legal status, one cannot have access to health care. Over time, ethnic Mexican struggles for justice and equality have been local and most successful when rooted in the particularities of time and place, raising issues of wage differentials and racial discrimination in local places of work at particular schools, demanding this or that essential city service, challenging restrictive covenants to home ownership, succeeding in some places, failing in others, contesting poll taxes, literacy tests, and at-large electoral districts while turning to the ballot box to achieve much narrower goals. The 1969 Plan Espiritual de Atzlan urged Chicanas and Chicanos to engage in a contestational cultural politics to defeat the gringo value system. As we look forward, I've thought hard, to, I've thought hard about trying to find sites for such and of such contestational cultural politics. Judy Baca's The Great Wall of Los Angeles stands out as a vibrant, democratic, and democratizing act of history making and community building across social divides based on race, class, gender, and sex. The wall chronicles the history of California from pre-Columbian times to the 1950s and shows that the narratives of this region can neither be Anglo nor Chicano, but are multicultural and require coalitions, egalitarian dialogue, and teamwork to a collective future. As Baca put it, quote, working to, towards the achievement of a difficult common goal shifted our understandings of each other and most importantly of ourselves, end quote. Gloria Anzaldúa elaborates the concept of mestiza consciousness in her book Borderlands La Frontera, The New Mestiza, in order to construct a more inclusive political community that can imagine the queer, the feminist, and the dark-skinned persons as allies in common struggle. To accomplish this, writes Anzaldúa, the new mestiza must first, quote, take inventory, differ differentiating between lo heredado, lo adquirido, lo impuesto, she puts history through a sieve, winnowing out the lies, looks at the forces that we are as a race, as women, have been part of. Luego bota lo que no vale, los desmientos, los desencuentros, los embrutecimientos. Aguarda el juicio hondo y enraizado en la gente antigua. She represents history, and using new symbols, she shapes new myths." End quote. Turning to the Aztec mother goddess Cuatlicue, who represents the dualities of male-female, life-death, sky-earth, Anzaldúa creates a genealogy that stretches backward from her mother to Cuatlicue that should serve us as a paradigm for the fragmentation and regulation of identities and for the necessity to navigate among them creatively in the borderlands. In her essay, A Long Line of Vendidas, which appeared in Loving and the Warriors, Sheri Moraga writes about her alienation from the Chicano movement thus, quote, I did not move away from other Chicanos because I did not love my people. I gradually became anglicized because I thought it was the only option available to me towards gaining autonomy as a person without being sexually stigmatized, end quote. In the years that followed, she explored her lesbian identity and from that understanding returned to rally us to forge a queer Atzlan, quote, a, a Chicano homeland that would embrace all of its people, including its joteria, end quote. What was wrong with the Chicano nationalism of the 1960s, as she says, was its heterosexism, its inbred machismo, and its lack of a cohesive national political strategy, end quote. Moraga now conjures a new Chicano nationalism, one that honors indigeneity, that is eco-feminist, whose micropolitics are coalitional and respectful of all life, both human and animal. Finally, I'll give you one further example. In the recent book by Alto Santana, Brown Tide Rising, Metaphors of Latinos and temporary American political discourse, he urges us to seize control of language and to fashion insurgent metaphors to invert the dominant metaphors that depict Mexicans as diseased, as sources of contagion, as an overwhelming tide, and as barbaric invaders. Otto enjoins us to give faces and identities to immigrants through personal stories and to invoke metaphors such as the following, quote, in the American Southwest, the immigrant stream makes the desert bloom bountifully, end quote. Quote, 
The wealth of the nation is enhanced by the golden stream of immigrants which flows into the country each year." End quote. The cities of the United States thirst for a steady flow of immigrants so that they may accomplish their labor needs." End quote. In focusing on these Chicana and Chicano contestational practices, I don't mean to elide or to even trivialize politics at the local or national level, whether it be exercised through the church, parent-teacher associations, community organizations, professional groups, or political parties. They have all been very important. But the lasting legacy of the Chicana and Chicano movement, 43 years after it was birthed in 1969, is the curricular change that it was introduced, that was introduced into high schools and colleges, and that allowed for the formation of Chicano and Chicano Studies department programs and centers, such as the one here at UCLA and the one at UC Santa Barbara. At this moment of incredible danger, when the Tucson Unified School District has dismantled Mexican-American studies, our response should be loud and should be consistent. As the poets and artists Gloria Anzaldúa and Sheri Moraga pointed us to mestiza consciousness and to Aquira Aslan as ways of imagining fractured identity politics, the tug between individualism and community, cultural citizenship and belonging at a moment of capitalist greed. Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz's second dream, uh, as described by, um, by Alicia Gaspar de Alva, was not just about same-sex love and desire. It was also about the erotics of learning and knowledge, which were fundamental to our ancestors and must remain to us if ever we are to have, indeed, an, uh, unless, we are ever, unless we are forever to remain an American un underclass marked by poverty and disease. Thank you. So I want to I want to thank you, um, Ramon, for for um, talking with us today, and I want to thank Chon and the staff of the um, center for uh, helping coordinate all the behind the scenes work uh, uh, to get us here. And thank you to my my friends in the audience um, and and to folks I don't know yet in the audience. I'm just going to say take a few mo moments just to kind of raise a few points, and you know the idea that we had was to kind of. Um, you know, that, that sort of in the mix of, of disciplines and perspectives and even generations that we'd kind of get some, um, just sort of provoke some of the discussion that, that we can have um, as, as, a, as a larger group. So, um, but before I say that though, I have, I have one more, more thing to say about um, Ramon, which, which I don't know that I've ever told you. And, and it, it, it has to do with something that Sean mentioned in his introduction, which is going back to um, when Jesus Came, the Corn Mothers Went Away, and its publication in 1991. I was a graduate student at the time. And it's not an understatement to say that that book transformed me and inspired me. Um, you know, not, not probably in the moment, because I'd already defended my prospectus and was already <laughs> sort of headed where I was headed in my first book, but it, it's, it certainly stayed with me, and it was just a, a momentous uh, a work for me in terms of, of influencing work that I, I uh, did late, later. Um, and hopefully I will continue be do to be doing at some point. Um, so I'm going to make just a few, um, a few comments, as I said. And the, f the first one is really a demographic point to bring home the, the uh, direction that you were taking in the paper, Ramon, and to think about a moment uh, coming up, right? So, so to get in our minds 2050 and think about that as uh, 102 years after the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And, and where we will be demographically. So the population, the, the, the white population in, 20, uh, in 2050 will be less than, uh, f less than 50% of the U.S. population. The Latino population will be 29% of the U.S. population, so almost twice that, that of what it currently is, um, which, which is really amazing to, to think about it. And I just I sort of want to connect those, those moments um, 1848 and um, and uh, 2050. Um, I did that math wrong, didn't I? Be 152 years. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, the um, the the next point that I want to want to make is is just to kind of bring a little bit of the uh, a little bit of more focus on 
several of the legal threads that Ramon um, uh, traced through his paper, which are, are in our contemporary moment really worth, worth um, stopping and thinking about. So the first is to think a little bit more about birthright citizenship <laughs> and, and its origins and why we have birthright citizenship. So there are a couple of things that I want to say. One, one is to say that most countries in the world don't have the equivalent of birthright citizenship. So for instance, if you are um, a Turkish immigrant in Germany, no matter how many generations you've been there, if you're Turkish, you're still not German, um, legally, culturally, or otherwise, right? So this was a American innovation. It was an innovation specifically born out of the struggle over slavery and the radical Republican Congress's struggle with the resistance to the end of the Civil War. And so, so that we get birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment in 1868 as a very deliberate, um, a very deliberate message to the southern states um, that they could not continue to subordinate the former slaves. And, and so, you know, I would like us in this current moment when, when this challenge to birthright citizenship is becoming, I think, increasingly legitimate to, to talk about and to assert, to go back to that initial moment more than we do and to really sort of link those two things, link the, uh, the uh, uh, end of slavery and the effort to, uh, the long and ongoing effort to equalize uh, uh, the situation for African Americans to this moment when Mexicans are being attacked um, uh, very directly with the threat of eliminating birthright citizenship. Um, and the other historical moment that I would link that to is to link it to the early 20th century alien land laws, right? So that the way that the, the alien land laws, of course, were targeted um, against Asians, Asian immigrants, particularly against Japanese immigrants. And the way that they were circumvented is that the children of that first generation were able to become U.S. citizens, and therefore they were, they were moot, right, after time passed. Um, and so again, those are, those are two ways in which we might link this birthright, the current birthright citizenship debate to these historical dynamics, which also allow us to build coalitions um, with um, other groups in this current, current um, struggle. Um, the, the second legal point is to talk a little bit more specifically about the post-Arizona legislation and specifically the, the new Alabama law, right, which takes, which goes even further. Um, and just a couple of provisions uh, of that law are, are worth just very, very briefly sketching out. One is the provision that empowers and, and that are different and more um, authoritarian than the, the the Arizona law. One is the um, provision that makes schools responsible for for checking um, students and um, uh, student citizenship, students' documentation, um, and and what that sets in motion, uh, which is probably going to be within the next uh, decade or so, a reversal of Plyler versus Doe, the nineteen. 91 uh, decision by the Supreme Court that, in, in which the Supreme Court told Texas that it could not discriminate, it, discriminate against undocumented students in the public schools. Um, another provision in that Alabama law is the um, provision that does not allow undocumented persons to engage in contracts. Um, a fundamental right um, under the Constitution but thinking about, thinking about this in relation to, for example, Abel's work on, uh, on day laborers, right, and thinking about just that basic notion that you as a worker who's undocumented don't have the right to engage in a contract with someone, and therefore that means that that agreement, that contract between you and that person, okay, you're going to pay me $5 an hour at the end of the day for, you know, 10 hours, et cetera, that that's not an enforceable contract under this regime. Um, so, so what this raises is the specter of um, what some are calling the brown codes of today as opposed to the black codes um, uh, uh, of earlier times. And again, I think lots of, lots of opportunities for imagining both dysutop dystopian and utopian uh, 
scenarios that can flow out of that. The final, um, the final sort of set of, of comments that I'll make has to do with, um, with how we think about Ramon's comments about the differences among Latinos and divisions among Latinos and, and sort of where we, we think of those fault lines. And, um, and here I'm really just kind of uh, musing about where we might go in terms of our political dream, our political fantasy about, um, about these various divisions. Um, so I'll, I'll start with um, immigration status, right, which you mentioned, Ramon, in your paper, and this, this line between those of us who are documented and those of us who are undocumented and the kind of um, advantages that that gives to the documented and disadvantages to the, the undocumented. Um, and, and, and to put a finer point on it, I think, you know, to, to just be very, for us to be very honest about the extent to which many Mexicans, Mexican Americans and Latinos are buying into that line as well. And, and, you know, capitalizing on that distinction between documented and undocumented or willing to exploit that, that um, difference to their advantage. Um, the second division is national origin, right? So, so we have, in, in some prior work, I have written about the transition from a Chicano ideology to a Latino ideology and the, uh, the, the push um, in electoral politics for this transition, um, which has, I'd say, now been entirely completed, right? So we very rarely talk specifically when we're talking about politics, we very rarely talk about the specific national origin groups. We tend to talk about Latinos or Hispanics. So that transition has, I think, been successfully completed. But we, we often don't stop to think about how that has affected the kinds of data that we use, uh, particularly, I think, those of us who are in uh, the social sciences, for example. It's very common for us to use the data that breaks down people into the categories African American, Latino, non Hispanic, white, for example. And in doing that, right, when we use that Latino category, we are putting into that, that group, that data point, the, uh, a, a group, Cuban Americans, that has higher wealth than whites. Right? So, so you know, we, we tend to think, oh, okay, here's where whites are, here's where Latinos are, here's where blacks are, and yet the, div the real differences within that group would, if we actually separated them out, would lead us to some different conclusions. And so I just think it's something we need to think about more than we often do. Um, uh, you talked briefly about, uh, especially at the end, about gender and sexual orientation differences. Um, and uh, the, the last uh, kind of cleavage that I'll mention among Latinos is generations. And here's where I want to talk about Vilma Ortiz and Eri Teas's book, Generations of Exclusion, published in 2008, um, which is really such an important, uh, such an important book for thinking about um, Mexican Americans and thinking, of, thinking really hard and in a really complex way about the differences among Mexican Americans by place, right, Texas, uh, San Antonio and Los Angeles, by thinking about generation, by thinking about age, class, um, gender, and so forth. And so, so um, I commend, uh, commend that work to you. Um, and I think I will, I will stop there and we can just open it up to this nice conversation. Thank you.